So welcome to our event this evening to celebrate the university's observance of Constitution Day. I'd like to begin by thanking all of you for attending today, especially to our uh, president, Jane Connolly, and our interim provost, David Dowell, and our dean, who is in attendance, uh, David Wallace, uh, for supporting today's celebration of Constitution Day. Uh, I say this often, but I feel like on Constitution Day, it's particularly appropriate to say again, namely, that the Constitution works in mysterious ways. It is active, contested, messy. Uh, when we like it, it's convenient to our political ideology. And when we negate it, or try to get it to say what we want when it's not convenient to our political ideology. This process is the way ideas are contested in democratic deliberation. Sometimes constitutional issues make their way to the Supreme Court with blazing speed, while at other times, the path takes much longer. The path to the recent landmark case on same-sex marriage took quite a while to reach the Supreme Court when viewed from the perspective of the historical struggle for gay rights. So today we'd like to celebrate Constitution Day by examining the recent landmark decision. I'll begin by explaining some of the pivotal moments in the struggle for gay rights in America leading up to the landmark case, and then I'll hand it over to our research director of the Center for First Amendment Studies, Dr. Christopher Derringer, who will talk about the current case and what's next. So let's begin about how we got here in the first place. What are those things that led up to same-sex marriage even being an issue and a movement for equality in the United States? The emergence of a sense of gay and lesbian community began to emerge roughly in the late 1800s and early 1900s in the United States, so far as we know. In early United States history, the burdens of subsistence farming and the primacy of the family in the economic process had precluded the emergence of a gay or lesbian co-culture for the most part in the United States. In the early 1900s, however, industrialization and urbanization brought a division of labor and large concentrations of individuals to social centers consisting of places like clubs, restaurants, bars, and music halls, and the earliest social networks for gay and lesbian people were found primarily in the major cities, such as Boston, Chicago, New York, San Francisco, and Washington. So uh, uh, many of people forget and don't know that World War II also played a major role in the way that uh, lesbian and gay community uh, formed. Scholars uh, by the names of Button, Wald, and Rienzo documented this in their work, for example, with the way that the war served to bring previously isolated gays and lesbians into contact with each other, creating greater opportunities for the expression of homosexual desire, while also raising expectations of many gays and lesbians who no longer wanted to remain closeted and secreted. Another excellent work by D'Amelio noted the way that World War II represented something of a nationwide coming out experience for American homosexuals. So I highly recommend uh, those, those two works uh, on this particular history. After World War II then, we entered uh, the, the Cold War. And the Cold War was an era that was marked by uh, uh, Senator McCarthy and the House on American Activities, and that led to an expansion and spread of, uh, of, uh, of resistance to a lot of unpopular groups, including homosexuals, during that particular area, era. In this era, police would raid gay and lesbian bars and clubs, and local vice squads even intruded into the homes of gay individuals. This is the era where we began to see anti-gay legislation prop up, including the criminalization of sodomy and the exclusion of gays and lesbians from statutes concerning employment discrimination, housing discrimination, rights of child custody, immigration, inheritance, security clearance, public accommodations, and police protection. In reaction to these anti-gay policies in the McCarthy era, there were societies and political movements started to spring up. The Mattachine Society was founded in Los Angeles in 1951. And in 1955, the Daughters of Belitis was established in San Francisco. They, along with other groups, organized to protest police harassment, to defend their right to congregate, 
to, and to back political candidates and to fight against employment discrimination. Then, in 1969, came the Stonewall Riots that sparked demonstrations for gay rights across America. By 1973, there were more than 800 gay political groups across the country, whereas prior to those Stonewall Riots, there were less than 50 such groups that existed. So it was a real momentous occasion to be able to, to grow the number of groups from 50 to 800. There was also a rise in community centers, health clinics, and, and professional associations and other support services. And in a major advancement, the American Psychiatric Association removed homosexuality from its classification as a mental disorder, a position that that association had held for almost a century. And so this was, so, so this was a, a huge movement that was, that was stemming for, for employment discrimination rights, for rights of housing protection and so forth. So then how did we get into this marriage mess to begin with? How did we get into this fight over same-sex marriage? Well, that is notably absent from a lot of this history. Marriage wasn't necessarily on the agenda in the early gay rights struggles. So it's important to note that, that same-sex marriage has not always occupied that central place in the LGBT rights agenda. The impetus that happened was that in 1993 to 1994, the LGBT movement was preoccupied with things like uh, a fights over employment discrimination, the Employment Non-Discrimination Act in, in, the, in, in Congress. It was also uh, rallying to, to be against the um, Bill Clinton's Don't Ask, Don't Tell policy. And so uh, those, were, those were major things that were moved uh, on the agenda as well as housing discrimination ordinance. So the national movement in the early 1990s seemed, seemed focused on other priorities than same-sex marriage. Enter where the conflict begins. Out in Hawaii, at the same time that this is where the conflict was occurring, three same-sex couples filed for marriage licenses in the state. They had met every legal requirement for the state's recognition of marriage, except for being of the same sex. Hawaii's Department of Health, who issues the licenses, consulted with the state's attorney general who asserted that under the Constitution, the right to marry is fundamental, but only for different sex couples. So the Department of Health then denied the marriage licenses, and the three couples filed suit against the state of Hawaii. In 1993, Hawaii's Supreme Court required the lower court to demonstrate a compelling state interest for denying same-sex couples their marriage rights. The legislature reacted to this decision by forming a commission to study whether there was a compelling interest. Then, in 1995, the commission recommended that Hawaii extend open marriage to same-sex couples. What that did in Hawaii by extending the right to marry in the state of Hawaii is that it sent shockwaves through much of the rest of the country with the religious right. Uh, and so, as a result, anti-same-sex marriage ordinances began spreading throughout the United States. Many people did not want, for example, people going to Hawaii, getting married, and then expecting that marriage to be recognized in Kansas, for example, right? And so they, they created a lot of these anti-same-sex mar marriage ordinances. As a result of that spread of these anti-same-sex marriage ordinances, the LGBT movement was forced to shift its focus on the national agenda. Its national agenda had prior to that been employment discrimination and those other things that I spoke to, but now it wanted to counter the anti-gay ideology that was couched and embedded in the anti-same-sex marriage ordinances. At the time, marriage occupied a lesser kind of place on the, on the totem pole, so to speak, for movement priorities. And the reason was quite simple. Some people had not really thought that marriage was a very desirable institution, uh, that it created normal 
uh, normative kind of assumptions that it wasn't very kind to bisexual people, for example, and that it, and that it would uh, force and enclose certain members of the movement into boxes that they should not necessarily be forced into. Whereas the unifying things like employment discrimination, that everyone should have a right to a job, became a, a, a main rallying point. And so they, they shifted this because there was a lot of anti-gay ideology that was embedded in the passage of these ordinances and it was important to the movement because it was such a national wave to counter this anti-gay ideology. It was a, a, a big deal. Thus, throughout the 1990s, same-sex marriage went from an issue relatively low on the LGBT movement's agenda to arguably the central place in the movement's uh, agenda today. So where have we been since? Since then, there are three, I would say, important cases that, recent, that were recently decided by the Supreme Court. The one, obviously, that we're going to talk about today, but I'll talk about the first two that led up to that Supreme Court decision as well. The first is United States versus Windsor. In 2007, two women who were residents of New York married each other in a lawful ceremony in Ontario, Canada. Edith Windsor and Thea Spire returned to their home in New York City after their marriage. As a widow, Windsor sought to claim a state tax exemption for surviving spouses. She was barred from doing so because of the federal defense of marriage law that was already in effect, which excluded a same-sex partner from the definition of spouse as that term is used in the federal statutes. So Windsor paid the taxes but filed suit to challenge the constitutionality of the provision. The case recently, recently had, had reached the Supreme Court a couple years ago, and it deemed that, uh, that a state entitled to recognition of the protection to enhance their own liberty. So it imposes a, a disability on the class by refusing to acknowledge a status the state finds dignified and proper. So what does that mean? It basically says that you can't exclude a certain class of people from the, the inheritance tax rights in those, le in those legal codes. So it overturned then those important provisions that were the basis and basic um, uh, 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 effectiveness or, or, uh, or compliance uh, mechanisms that were built in to the defense of marriage law. There's two things that were, that were left uncertain, though. The first one is that the ruling did not apply and say that same-sex marriage was the constitutional right of same-sex couples. So it had left that question open. And, so, and then the second is that the ruling was confined to those couples who, were, who would be legally married already. And so it wouldn't protect the couples who maybe had their marriages nulled and void based on other state laws. And so uh, that, that, that decision that over and reversed DOMA was not clear and set in stone. The second case then was Hollingsworth versus Perry. And this is one that we're all, well, most of us are familiar with in the state of California. After the California Supreme Court held that limiting marriage to opposite sex couples violated the California Constitution, state voters passed a ballot initiative that many of us are familiar with, which was Proposition 8. The proposition amended the state constitution to define marriage as a union between a man and a woman. What then happened was a somewhat bizarre path to the Supreme Court. Same-sex couples who wanted to marry filed suit in federal court challenging Proposition 8 under the due process and equal protection clauses of the 14th Amendment and naming as defendants California's governor and other state and local officials responsible for enforcing California's marriage laws. However, in that case, the officials refused to defend the law. So even though it was law, the, the people who were charged to defend the law in court refused to defend the law in court, so then therefore the law wouldn't have any uh, validity to it. And so when it came to the Supreme Court, the court ruled that it is unconstitutional for a private party to represent the public in federal court because no public official was going to allow the private party to represent 
the public officials in the court, and so uh, they didn't have any standing. So, th and there were two implications in terms of procedural issues. So same-sex marriage has had its implications not just in the realm of, of marriage rights, but in terms of procedural rights and what are required by state and public officials, there's also the issue that a precedent had been set here that public officials are able to, re to refuse representing the democratic will of the people. So if Proposition 8 passed and the governor and so forth do not want to defend the state of California in enforcing that provision, they can refuse to do that, right? And so they don't have to defend a proposition in court even if it's passed by the people. And since Proposition 8 was effectively overruled then, it left the previous California Supreme Court ruling intact such that same-sex couples may marry in the state of California. So these were the two major uh, decisions that had been levied on same-sex marriage cases and then paved the way to an equal protection type of ruling that would then uh, come in the, the recent landmark case. So I'd like to turn it over now to our research director of the Center for First Amendment Studies, uh, Dr. Christopher Derringer, and he'll talk a little bit about the current case that was just recently decided and some of the, the what's next kind of questions. And, and then after he's finished, we'll answer some questions from the audience. I'm certainly delighted to be here with you today. And by now, I'm sure that everyone's aware of the score of the landmark decision in Obergefell v. Hodges. It was a five to four to vote, and it affirmed the fundamental right to marry is guaranteed to same-sex couples. In my time with you today, what I'd like to do is to offer some analysis of the rhetoric of the majority decision. And by that, I want to be clear. I'm not an attorney. I'm a rhetorician who's a fan of the law, and so I wouldn't want to be mistaken as someone who's offering legal analysis. What I'm trying instead is to aim at understanding the way that Justice Kennedy's decision works rhetorically, how it packages and makes seductive a legal argument, a justification for a decision. Now, nearly all of the comment that I have heard in popular culture on this decision concerns what is really the final paragraph of the decision. I've heard a lot of talk about the beautiful prose, particularly if your politics match it, the beautiful prose of Justice Kennedy's final words on the subject. But I think that the earlier material deserves elucidation, too. And so I'd like to draw your attention to the argumentation that precedes it. And if my analysis is compelling today, then I think that you may depart with a new awareness of the profoundly conservative ways that Justice Kennedy sometimes justifies state recognition of same-sex marriage. And more interestingly to me, the particular epistemology, that is the particular approach towards knowledge and truth that he invokes in justifying the courts and his own evolution on the need for a major change to how we conceive of the right to marry. So I'd like to start with catching us up where Dr. Johnson left off. In 2013, the Supreme Court overturned the, the uh, DOMA in U.S. v. Windsor. And this eliminated the federal definition of marriage as man and woman and required that the federal government recognize people who had solemnized their marriages legally. But it didn't do away with a number of state bans. So James Obergefell and his partner John Arthur traveled to the state of Maryland so that they could be married. They had to travel to the state of Maryland because they lived in Ohio, which did not permit same-sex marriage. And it was important that they get the marriage solemnized, frankly, in a hurry because Mr. Arthur was suffering from ALS. So when they returned home to, the, to Ohio, the state refused to recognize their marriage. And what that means is that the state refused to list Mr. Obergefell as the surviving spouse on Mr. Arthur's death certificate. And so this led to the case, uh, Obergefell v. the state of Ohio in the form of Governor Kasich. And the verdict was uh, District Judge Timothy Black ruled that the state of Ohio must recognize that marriage. And his reasoning was fairly simple. He said, look, the state of Ohio recognizes other sorts of marriages performed in other states which are not legal in Ohio but were legal there. So if you go to a state which permits you to marry your first cousin, when you return to Ohio, the state of Ohio honors that. If you go to a state that allows you to marry somebody who's 15 and you return to Ohio, they honor that marriage. And so his argument goes that there was no good reason, no compelling state interest for them 
them not to also recognize other forms of marriage which were legal elsewhere when solemnized. Ohio Attorney General uh, Mike DeWine appealed the case to the Sixth Circuit Court. And the Sixth Circuit Court merged that case with several other cases dealing with same-sex marriage and state recognition of marriages. And the appeal was decided in the other direction. And the, what the court said was that these bans were constitutional on the basis of a verdict in Baker v. Nelson, where the Supreme Court has, had essentially said there's no federal issue in the question of same-sex marriage. But it just wasn't a problem at the federal level. And so the Sixth Circuit had used that as a justification for uh, overturning the original ruling. So what I'd like to point out here is that this case, the Ohio case, was much different than the other appeals happening around the country in the Fourth, the Seventh, Ninth, and Tenth Circuit Courts. And so what that sets up for uh, the Supreme Court is a contradiction, where now you have different circuit courts all claiming to know what the Constitution would say. And this really is the reason why we need a Supreme Court verdict. And so uh, we have Justice Kennedy's opinion. And what I'd like to do is to sort of guide you through the argument, and then I'll circle back around to try to point out to you what I think are the most compelling things to notice about that argument. What Kennedy begins by noting is that there's really two questions that the court agreed to decide on. The first was, does the 14th Amendment require a state to license same-sex marriages? And the second is really the one that concerned Obergefell and, and his partner originally. Does the 14th Amendment require a state to honor a marriage performed elsewhere if it was legal where it was performed? And in the beginning of the decision, what you're going to find is Justice Kennedy narrating the history of the subject and really expounding on the significance of marriage. Why is this such a fight? And what he says is things that I suspect we all would agree, that marriage is an institution of transcendent importance, that marriage is something that's sacred to the religious and the non-religious alike, that marriage has long been understood as a stabilizing force. And this is a beautiful verdict in some ways, and so I will draw your attention sometimes to the word for word. Here's what he says, that marriage is something that binds strangers into relatives, uh, turns strangers into relatives, binds families and societies together. He points to luminaries like Confucius and Cicero and really can point to them in every society who all understand and have nominated marriage as the cornerstone of civil society. And so it must be admitted that marriage is incredibly important. And he also must admit, he says, that marriage has throughout time been conceived in terms of a union of opposite sex individuals. And it's at this point that he stops to sum up the positions of the people involved. The respondents say, quote, it would demean a timeless institution if marriage were extended to same-sex couples. But the petitioners, he sums up, seek the right to marry specifically because they so value this institution and prize the privileges and responsibilities that have become attached to it. And, and this is another quote from his decision, their immutable nature dictates that same-sex marriage is their only real path to this profound commitment. It's important to Justice Kennedy that this is the only way that a person could get to these privileges. It will become important in a little while here. Then Justice Kennedy reminds us that while it is true and while he agrees with the respondents that marriage is an institution with timeless appeal, it's also an institution which has experienced a number of changes. For instance, we no longer really think kindly about arranged marriages. And we're no longer fans of the law of coverture, which submerges a woman's identity under that of her husband so that she becomes a part of his estate. He says, quote, as women gained legal, political, and property rights, and as society began to understand that women have their own equal dignity, the law of coverture was abandoned. And on arranged marriages, he says, marriage was once viewed as an arrangement by a couple's parents, but by the time of the nation's founding, it was understood to be a voluntary contract. He's pointing out that we go through a process of discovery, of understanding, and outdated aspects of marriage, which at the time, he will point out, were considered to be essential. When we encounter, his quote, new insights, we determine that those changes that we made to those essential parts of marriage actually strengthen the institution. He says, new dimensions of freedom become apparent to new generations, 
as perspectives are developed on the margins of society and then pushed into the public sphere in the judicial system, justices identify and perceive new dimensions of freedom which they had not conceived of before. So I think I'd like to point two things to you right out of the gate. Justice Kennedy is dispensing with two of the more evergreen arguments against same-sex marriage. First, that it would devalue the institution, and second, that it would represent a change to an institution which has a traditional, clear, unambiguous meaning. What's his answer? The first one was, it will not devalue the institution because same-sex couples, in fact, desire it specifically because they so much value it as an institution. I think this is an interesting answer, and the argument coach in me wants to say this is a bit of a shift. What he's saying is that the petitioners do not intend to devalue this institution. Whether that's the same thing as being sure that they won't is something that he doesn't exactly get around to, but you may say that the strength of an institution lies only in the good faith that the people participating in it have. And if that's the case, then he seems to believe that there's no reason to believe that these couples would devalue ins ins the institution. But his second argument seems to me much more satisfying. He clearly points to a number of the important changes in the institution of marriage. We no longer marry our kids off as if they were stock options, and we no longer subsume our spouse's identity under a man so that she becomes a little more than his estate. Noting these changes affects aspects of marriages that were once considered to be essential also points out that there's no reason to believe that the changes here will also eventually come to be considered important and strengthening changes. And I would also say that this might be a moment where we can see an implicit refutation to the off-sided, although frankly foolish, argument that we can find in Justice Roberts' dissent that reproduction is an essential part of marriage. I think Justice Kennedy would point to the law of coverture or, a, or arranged marriages and say simply because we believe it to be essential at some point doesn't mean that it is. If nothing else though, what's clear here is that the argument that marriage has a clear, unambiguous, trans-historical meaning is inaccurate. Even if the appeal to tradition weren't an argumentative fallacy, Justice Kennedy explains that it's simply not the case. He then moves on to argue that we've already made alterations to our thinking about the other rights of gay and lesbian persons in our country. That the state had long deemed homosexual intimacy to be immoral, and so those engaged in it were denied their dignity. dignity. He points out that, as Dr. Johnson already explained, homosexuality was for quite a long time pathologized as mental illness. But more recently, and here's his words, more recently psychologists have recognized that sexual orientation is a normal expression and immutable, which is to say not something a person could choose. In the late 20th century, he narrates, same-sex couples began to live more open and public lives. And this was followed by a lengthy public discussion in government, in public, and in the judiciary. And eventually this led to T Lawrence v. Texas in which the court reversed its course and held that same-sex intimacy bans demean the lives of homosexual persons. From an argumentative perspective, what's happening here is argument by, by analogy. Justice Kennedy seems to be implying that we managed to alter our conceptions about what is appropriate and publicly recognizable displays of intimacy, and it didn't destroy anything. Same-sex couples didn't stop enjoying their sex lives because we'd legalized other people to have sex lives. So uh, Justice Kennedy then moves on to summarize what I already have to explain why the case is now before the court. He points out that what he perceives to be a general trend of legalization and states deciding that same-sex marriage is constitutional, but we now have this case. And so with that out of the way, Justice Kennedy ends up holding that the 14th Amendment requires the state to permit same-sex marriage on the basis of two parts of the amendment, the Due Process Clause and the Equal Protection Clause. And I'd like to walk you through the arguments that he makes. The Due Process Clause is there to ensure that no state shall deprive any persons of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. As I understand it, this means that state regulation of liberties must be based on fair processes, but also that the state's interest in regulating action and the value of that regulation has to be balanced alongside the cost to individual freedoms. And some freedoms are so especially protected, like those in the Bill of Rights, 
or those that are central to individual dignity and autonomy that they cannot be encroached upon. Justice Kennedy points out that there's no formula for this, that there's no way to know prima facie whether or not some infringement is constitutional. He says it is the job of the court to exercise reason judgment in identifying interests so fundamental that the state has to respect them. And this is a hard job, he says, because, quote, the nature of injustice is that we may not always see it in our own times. When new insight reveals discord between the Constitution's central protections and a received legal stricture, a claim to liberty must be addressed. I'm going to draw your attention back to how many times you're going to hear me say the words new insight or understandings or discourse. Well, he says that it's no doubt, though, that marry, marriage has long been held as one of these rights. This is why, for instance, the court has struck down bans on interracial marriage. It's why the court has struck down bans on the marriage of, of prisoners. He admits that the court has erred in the past. This is how he characterizes Baker v. Nelson. But why did they make the mis this mistake? He says, we erred in Baker v. Nelson saying that there was no federal interest because, quote, the court made assumptions defined by the world and the time of which it is part. We'll come back to this. He says, it turns out that the, the right to marry has been identified as constitutionally protected for four big reasons. First, the right to marry is inherent in the concept of individual autonomy. So to take away someone's right to marry is to take away their agency, their ability to act freely in the world in the most important ways. Secondly, he says the right to marry supports a two-person union like any other, unlike any other in its importance. In other words, there is no substitute. And so when you take away marriage, you've given someone no other option to get the things that they get through marriage. Those are interesting and those are expected. The second set of two reasons I think are much more interesting. Third, he says, protecting the right to marry safeguards children and families and thus draws meaning from related rights of child rearing, procreation, and education. And fourth, because marriage is a keystone of our nation's social order. We might notice, he says, that society has pledged to support married couples with tax breaks, inheritance and property rights, spousal privileges in court, hospital access, medical decision-making, insurance benefits, and that's a small piece of the list that the justice actually provides. And he reasons that when the state denies these symbolic and material benefits to same-sex couples, it is in fact undercutting societal stability. That if you grant that marriage is something that is the cornerstone of our social order, when you deny it to individuals, what you're doing is to undercut social order. So thus far, Justice Kennedy has determined that the right of same-sex couples to marry is a choice central to their individual dignity and autonomy, and that it must be protected. But he's going to go on to argue that the Equal Protection Clause also protects, or also requires, that the government permit same-sex marriage. The Equal Protection Clause prevents the state from treating individuals differently than another unless it has a rational and legitimate state interest in doing so. Your government treats you differently all the time. Uh, for instance, they treat drug dealers differently than non-drug dealers. No one has a problem with that. But they're not allowed to treat people with blue eyes differently than people with green eyes unless they can show a legitimate state interest in doing so. At this point, Justice Kennedy notes that there's a bit of a synergistic relationship between these two clauses. The Due Process Clause that protects your freedoms and then the Equal Protection Clause that protects you from discrimination. What happens is periodically through conversation with each other, through public discourse, we discover the Constitution owes us a freedom. And at that point, through the Due Process Clause, we then find that we also have an Equal Protection Clause problem as well. He says, as the court, quote, develops new insights and societal understandings of constitutionally protected liberties, it is then prompted to recognize that that law is in violation of the Equal Protections Clause. Quote, it is now clear that the challenged laws burden the liberty of same-sex couples, and it must be further acknowledged that they abridge central concepts in equality. So now that it is recognized that marriage is fundamental to individual dignity and central to liberty, we can now appreciate also that it is a violation of the Equal Protection Clause to only deny that central liberty to some people.
it's my goal in this address to draw your attention to rhetorical strategies by which Kennedy legitimates his decision to overturn the same-sex marriage ban. And having walked you through the argumentation, I'd like to point out two features that really stand out to me. The first is the distinctively conservative justifications for state recognition of same-sex marriage. Basically, Justice Kennedy takes the position that the state has a compelling interest in making sure that gay and lesbian people can form stable family units and from this, safer communities. So at the same time that we find and would expect this, this, just, this, excuse me, this verdict to be about preserving choice and individual dignity and autonomy, there's quite a lot of language in this decision about protecting children and pulling human relations under the watchful eye of the state apparatus. So in this passage, Justice Kennedy is making arguments that could make same-sex marriage appealing both to libertarians but also to law and order conservatives. What he's effectively saying is, yes, you should be able to make these important decisions that are central to your sense of self and your dignity, but also the polis is best served when the state encourages the creation of certain kinds of stable family units where children can be reared. This is not a point that I ever hear marriage equality, make, marriage equality advocates making very loudly, and I think it could have been a very powerful one. If we say that we care much about our children and about the strength of our neighborhoods and communities, how can we resist the rhetorical force of an argument that says that you're denying this when you deny marriage? This runs contrary to conservative discourses about family values and about same-sex marriage somehow tearing at the fabric of society. So rhetorically, what's interesting here to me is how often Justice Kennedy is foregrounding not gay individuals but the family. By switching from individuals to families, he's in fact, uh, he's really making a very conservative argument that you should be in favor of this because it's good for society, it's good for your community. The second thing that I find interesting in this verdict is a clear attempt to depict this change in his thinking as a result of an evolving understanding of the facts rather than simply caving to the pressure of public opinion. There's no doubt that public opinion had changed courses, and Justice Kennedy re refers to this at various points. But if you look back upon this decision, and if you even think about the quotes that I have offered you, you will find numerous examples of new understandings, new insights, recognition, dialogue, and conversation at every turn. Justice Kennedy is clearly trying to position this major reversal as a course correction necessitated not by public opinion, but by new perceptions of realities which were in fact always there. This is something that makes sense to me when I put it in conversation with a concept advanced by two scholars uh, of rhetoric. Churwitz and Hikins call this rhetorical perspectivism. It's an approach to knowledge which we could think about as a midpoint between realism and subjectivism. Real world, realism saying that the truth is always out there and it's unchanging and it's available to us if we simply open our eyes. And subjectivism, which we might characterize or maybe caricature as truth is what we all decide it is. And I suspect that as you read the dissenting opinions, you'll find some of the justices seem to think that that's what Justice Kennedy is doing that Justice Kennedy is caving to public opinion, and that we might just decide that marriage is something else some other time. But that's not what I see in this verdict. What I see is an embrace of an epistemology that says that an objective reality exists, but it is composed of entities whose significance, whose meaning is recognized when we stand in relation to them. And so the pivotal moment of understanding is when we are brought into consciousness of new entities and new relationships. And that is something that happens almost always in communication with others. When we are brought into radical experiences with otherness, when we are confronted with experiences and perspectives that don't match ours, we are forced to reevaluate our consciousness. So it's not for Justice Kennedy that homosexual affiliation and homosexual love has just now become something worthy of protection under the Constitution. It's simply that our collective perception of those propositions is new. We now understand that sexual orientation is immutable, which is to say we can't change it any more than we can decide not to be Mexican-American. And once through direct experience or through symbolic action, we come to recognize a gap between our actions and what we aspire to be, we are, we are obligated to make a change. 
It's not the raw facts of the injustice which changed, but it's our improved perception of that injustice which sparks change. In much the same way that improved understandings of race and ethnicity forced us, people of conscience at least, to abolish the sick institution of slavery, Kennedy finds that he must now abolish the exclusion of some individuals from the institution of marriage. I draw your attention to this because I think it's something that's going to figure into future law cases. One of the things that you're going to find in some of the dissenting opinions is the argument that this, that this decision opens the door for plural marriage. Uh, Justice Roberts, I believe, says, well, what if four men and two women want to get married? I think what you find in Kennedy's decision is a very clear answer to that. It's not that they are catering simply to the tide of public opinion. Instead, a careful analysis of this decision suggests that the justices in the majority believe that regardless of public opinion, new perceptions of reality have prompted a recognition that extant laws are, in fact, violating rights which were always constitutionally protected. This recognition of the power of human communication to bring us to understand new viewpoints and to confront the experiences of others seems to me to be the unsung treasure of this landmark verdict and one that I suspect is going to be a part of future cases. Thank you. And we have about 10 to 15 minutes for some questions from the audience. If we can, if anybody, if anybody has any questions. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, Justice Scalia was so scathing in his uh, mm -hmm. Mm. Can you touch on any of his legal arguments and, and just give your mm. opinion on the validity of his arguments? Because he was, I mean, just so scathing. Mm -hmm. Do you want me to do that? Please do. Okay. Um, I think that Justice Scalia's decision comes out of two related contexts. One is a brand of constitutional interpretation known as uh, originalism. And his argument is uh, also, his brand of originalism is to, is to take a brand of textualism. What, is the, what do those fancy words mean? It means that when Scalia is evaluating a, an opinion, he looks at the words in the Constitution, he looks at what those words mean as we would commonly understand them, and if the right's there, it's there. If it's not there, vote and then the democracy is left to be able to vote for it however it wants, okay? On that particular perspective for Justice Scalia, he looks at the Constitution. He looks to see, is there anywhere in this Constitution that outlines marriage as a right? And he says it's not anywhere in the document. There's nowhere in there that says that there's a marriage amendment, this equal protection clause, was not about marriage to begin with. I mean, there's no definition of the Equal Protection Clause that would be, uh, that would be consistent with that. And so he says that, the, the, so his philosophy then is to say that if it's not there, then you should exercise some judicial restraint. So that, in other words, the Supreme Court should say, leave it up to the democracy in the democratic process to battle this out. The movement's gaining momentum, public opinion is changing. If you want same-sex marriage, work through the legislature. That's how democracy operates. And it's not for the role of the judiciary to legislate, in his words, from the bench, what the policy ought to be. And so I think he was upset in terms of the, the, the way that that was interpreted because he believes that it was an overstretch of judicial authority and he believes that the extension and implication of that is a dissolving of the public's trust in the court being an, arbitra uh, uh, an arbitrator in so many of these cases. So that's one, I think, perspective that he's taking. So his scathing remarks are, are, are part of his scathing sentiment toward this type of brand of judicial activism that he's been a long critique of. I don't think that that's enough to characterize what's going on in his decision. 
The second thing that I think is going on in his dissent is that he's embracing a conservative resistance toward same-sex marriage rights in general, right? And so he doesn't, he thinks that same-sex marriage is immoral and not only is it immoral, it's not something that judges should be able to rule on it, on a constitutional basis. Now, the brand of constitutionalism then that he comes from reinforces this web of anti-same-sex marriage arguments that have been made historically. I've done a study uh, that I published about 12 years ago now, uh, and it analyzes over 400 different texts that have made arguments against same-sex marriage. And the argumentative structure of these arguments revolve around five fundamental premises, right? You've got religious argumentation, which is based in the Bible and so forth. You have scientific appeals that it's not uh, biologically within our, 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 our DNA and so forth. There's no gay gene, and so therefore it's not uh, a, a characteristic of what it means to come to be defined as human, right? Um, the third is majority rule, because the majority of the people don't want same-sex marriage and same-sex marriage ought not to be legalized. The fourth is an appeal to tradition, right? That we've never had same-sex marriage before, and so therefore, why would we be enacting that today when that's not part of our tradition? And then the fifth part of that web of argument relies on procreation and the betterment of the children that I think that uh, Professor Derringer did, uh, went over pretty well about those uh, arguments. And so if you look at Justice Scalia's arguments, they are embedded in the same kind of web of reasoning that are, that are traditionally part of this conservative rhetoric. Now here's where it comes into, 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 into a problem. In the 1990s, remember my point was that marriage was never really on the movement's agenda to begin with. And the reason that it was put on the agenda was because of an anti-gay ideology, right? And that anti-gay ideology is composed of those five elements, right? And one of the most dominant element in that anti-gay ideology is a religious appeal, right? And that religious appeal saying that homosexuality is a sin was one of the, is, is the forefront appeal. Now, why does this become a problem in the same-sex marriage cases? It's because in the case of, United, of Loving versus Virginia, in the interracial case, the, inter the right to, inter to marry somebody of an opposite race, the lower court opinion in the Commonwealth of Virginia, the judge ruled based on a biblical premise that God had created brown, yellow, black, and melee, placed them on separate continents, and therefore did not mean them to be equal. So it begs the question then, what comes first? Is it the racism, the homophobia, and then you interpret the biblical text the way that you want it to be interpreted to meet your needs? Or is it the other way around? Are you open to alternative readings or maybe more enriched readings of scripture that may embrace uh, different kinds of sentiments? There's been some really good work in this area. The work of John Boswell comes to mind, for example, on homosexuality, Christianity, and social tolerance, where they take a look at the biblical scripture and the work of translation. When the, when the Bible's originally written in uh, Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic, and when it's translated into English, then it has to do the work where cultures can understand that, right? So how would you understand, and I'm not, an expert in this area, but it's, if I'm recalling this argument correctly, there's a word in Hebrew that I think is arsenicatoi. And arsenicatoi meant something like uh, a, a word that was supposed to represent excess, right? Uh, the eating too much and throwing up, or orgiastic sex, and, all of, and, uh, and worshiping all of these false gods, right? And it was all of these kinds of behaviors that were bound up into this concept, but the concept was really like excess, right? And so when it comes to translating a word like that, how are you gonna communicate it? Well, at the time, there was 
a culture of homosexuals that were engaged in many excessive behaviors, and they use the word homosexuality in the Bible to make that point that we shouldn't be engaged in these kinds of behaviors. Does that mean that we shouldn't be homosexual the way that we know about it today, right? Our understanding of the person, right? So, for example, when, I, when, when uh, a popular argument is, you know, you ought not be listening to that gangster rap or something, right? Or you ought not be a gangster rapper. Now, I say, hold on, right? It's not gangster rap that's the problem. But, you know, it's probably not a pretty good lifestyle to go shooting your guns off in the air and, and, and practicing unsafe sex and things like that. And we know the kind of negative moral qualities that we would ascribe to that. Does that mean don't dress hip hop? Don't be hip hop? No, that's not what we're talking about, right? But the, the translation, so that's a long way of saying that I think Justice Scalia's argument is couched in that conservative structure of argumentation coupled with his judicial philosophy and it begs the question of whether or not his uh, homophobia comes first or if it's just a manifestation of the philosophy and therefore not homophobic but legalistic, which uh, most advocates today are not going to be in agreement with. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Mm -hmm. Your comment about uh, Justice Scalia at the end there that's a different light on how he opened his dissent, where he said, I don't have a particularly compelling interest in this. Uh, he does have a compelling interest in it, and he's not really honest about that. Well, and as a rhetorical scholar, you probably know of the, 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 the trope and figure apophasis, where I'm going to deny something, you know, I'm not going to mention my opponent's uh, drinking habit, but I am going to focus on the issues tonight, right? You're denying it by doing it, right? So it's probably a... And it's a move that allows him to deny that he is, that he could be read as homophobic. Mm -hmm. He doesn't have an interest, it's just... And to present himself as an unbiased observer. <laughs> Isn't it the job of the judicial branch to make their own interpretations of the Constitution and then make a decision to settle an argument like this that cannot be settled on its own in the states? Uh, yeah, I mean, it is, the, it is the job of the Supreme Court to apply their reading of the Constitution uh, against or against the details of a particular case that they're operating under. One of the frustrating parts that Chief Justice Roberts has noted, for example, is that they can't even intervene in a in a in a conflict between the executive and the legislative branch unless the case comes before them. Right? The Supreme Court can only speak through the cases that come to them. If the cases don't come to them, then they don't get to say anything about it, right? And the cases don't always make it to them. If it doesn't make past the first appeal, it can't go to the Supreme Court, right? I mean, it, it, that's the way that, that the process operates. The trick of it is that people, the justices very much disagree on the notion, the, the major difference is whether or not the constitutional text should be what's called a living document, or we should interpret it based on the way that the framers who envisioned it to apply at the time meant for it to mean, right? And there's theoretical arguments that go back and forth. The living document people say, we're the ones who have to live with this constitution. The people who made the Constitution are not the ones that are living with it. We're living with it, right? So we should be interpreting it the way that we think the Constitution ought to mean. So if we, you know, in, that, in that interpretation, it should change. The more powerful, is, that makes it sound whimsical. That's the argument that Justice Scalia would make, is that it's whimsical. The more powerful argument for a living Constitution is the one that says, we need to have the ability to mature as a country, to realize our principles that were there at the outset, but that the framers 
could not settle all the details about. So they let democracy flourish and they assigned the role of the judiciary in order to make some of these kinds of decisions. And so just as a teenager may not make the same decisions about right and wrong as, uh, uh, as they would when they're 40 years old, right? They have an evolved understanding and appreciation based on experience. America is learning a lot about itself through its experiences, right? There's a lot of things about our history that we don't like. We don't have to, I mean, we can name off a laundry list of things, you know, we don't like slavery, you know, I mean, these are easy things to be able to say that we don't like about our history. So the living document people would say, we need to have the ability to evolve and to mature. The historical arguments would say, you know, the, the, the framers were pretty genius and they wanted the courts to exercise judicial restraint. They didn't want the Supreme Court to be able to make these decisions about what's mature and what's not and so forth. If you want to make it work by, uh, by, uh, for yourself, there's two ways to do it. Justice Scalia would say, if you don't want the death penalty, make the death penalty illegal. There's nothing in the Constitution that says you have to have a death penalty. But you can't say that it's unconstitutional because it's a cruel and unusual punishment. That's not what the framers envisioned when they were writing cruel and unusual punishment. So the historical interpretation would leave it up to the democratic process. And they would say that if there are things that they're not allowed to do, that there's also the process of amending the Constitution to allow those things to take hold. And so that's, I think, the major difference between the living document people and the historical interpretation, and that is the battle of our court today. We have run out of time, though. I would like to thank you once again for attending this Constitution Day event 2015. I uh, invite you to be able to visit our website uh, the, for the Center for First Amendment Studies at California State University, Long Beach, and also to attend our event for Constitution Day in 2016 and it's held on September 17th of every single year. Thank you for coming.